All right, so let's talk about respiratory stuff for a few minutes. So we've got a 14-year-old who comes in with severe shortness of breath, has a history of asthma, no relief from home NEBS, EMS has went ahead and gave her some albuterol and ipatropium twice. There's her vital signs. She's a little tachycardic, a little tachypnic. Sats are right there on the borderline, 93% of room air. She's got a lot of wheezing, a lot of accessory muscle use. So what are you going to do next? She's already had a couple of albuterols. She's already had some uh, ipatropium as well. What's going to be our next step? We're going to give her some more albuterol? Please don't. <laughs> it's not going to work. So steroids. What else? Magnesium, yes. And maybe a different beta agonist like epinephrine. So we've got several other options out there. But if they've had five or six albuterol nebs and it's not fixing them, please stop and do something else. Because all you're going to do is get their heart rate up even more and make them more anxious and probably not fix them. Yes. We'll come back to that. Yes. So with asthma, a chronic obstructive reversible airway disease. Most people that have asthma have some type of immunological trigger. They get exposed to a pollen, dander, something that triggers the immune response. Now also a big trigger, especially this time of the year, is viral infections. It causes the reaction, but it's not truly immunological. But what happens is we activate the immune response, we release good old histamine, histamine causes mucus production and airway narrowing. That's what happens with asthma. So our whole focus is trying to reverse the airway narrowing and suppress that immune response. Where was COPD? Most of our people that have COPD have it from chronic smoking. Occasionally, we'll run to people that actually have it from either secondary exposure or from occupational exposure. But most people, chronic smoking. Your typical emphysema patient. This person is the classic barrel chest appearance. They have caused significant alteration of their lung compliance. So now they have great distension but their alveoli don't come back to normal, so they have that classic barrel appearance. Well, your chronic bronchitis patient, that's your chronic productive cough. This person produces all that thick sputum, and they're chronically trying to get all that thick sputum up. It is a subset of these patients that I have to worry about being CO2 retainers. Because most of us remember from initial nursing or medical education, they're like, oh, don't give more than two liters, you'll kill them. Not really the case for most people but it's a small group of these chronic bronchitis patients we have to worry about. But they're going to have that respiratory distress, that dyspnea at rest, may have some wheezes, a lot of accessory muscle use. So just kind of give you this table, just kind of help you differentiate what we see with some of these. But barrel chest is classic for emphysema. Do I hear wheezing or not? If I don't hear wheezing, do I hear good lung sounds? Occasionally, you don't hear wheezing because they're not moving any air. They're so tight. So croup an acute viral infection, usually causes uh, problems this time of the year. Most we think about this with young kids, but we also get even adults that get croup. They get that inflammation of the airways, it causes that narrowing, gives them that classic strider, some of that barky cough that we'll sometimes see. But usually it's a viral infection, low-grade fever, and most of these kids don't look toxic. They look sick, but they don't look toxic. And I'm really concerned is when they're laying there doing nothing and they have strider. If they're running around the room striderous, that's probably okay. But when they're laying there doing nothing and they're striderous, that's when I really get concerned. So our drugs. So anticholinergics or antimuscarinics, most of these are only FDA approved for treatment with COPD, but we use them in asthma as well, off-label. Anticholinergics are going to cause a couple things to happen. They're going to reduce mucus production. They do have some anti-inflammatory properties, and they do have some muscle relaxation properties. So they're kind of like a beta agonist, but not truly a beta agonist. They work on a different platform. But they're going to give us several benefits there and usually used in combination with a beta agonist. Typically, anticholinergics are first-line drugs for initial COPD management, depending on the severity of their disease. But anticholinergics are going to work a couple of ways and give us a couple of benefits. So asthma, COPD, maintenance, we may use them in acute exacerbations. They do have some synergistic effects. Luckily, they're localized effects, so not too many systemic effects. But if somebody has really bad BPH or really bad glaucoma, that's the person I might be more considered of not using an anticholinergic. For the most part, it's localized effects of the lung tissue, but in large doses could cause some systemic effects. Our beta agonists are a mainstay for asthma, 
management and acute exacerbation management as well. The big thing about beta agonists is they're going to give us sometimes localized effect, but sometimes systemic effects. And most of these are beta-2 agonists. So they're going to prefer beta-2 over beta-1, but they still give us some beta-1 effects. And some people are a little bit more sensitive than others when we talk about beta effects. So an initial patient comes in with a lot of respiratory distress, a beta agonist should be our goal. But if they've already had several doses of a beta agonist, we need to think about other options. But these are going to have a little bit also of anti-inflammatory properties as well. They do tend to help reduce that mucus production. They do kind of help smooth out those inflammatory processes as well. But they're not always going to be best for every patient by themselves. So epinephrine is a really good beta agonist. We don't always think about it with asthma, but definitely that patient who's had multiple doses of albuterol or leave albuterol and they're not better, maybe we should go to epinephrine. And there's really good evidence, and this is in the guidelines, that if they've had multiple doses of beta agonist, let's think about epinephrine next. That could be inhaled, or that could be an injection in the thigh, works just as well. Probably IV is our least uh, used, and definitely only in severe cases. But just keep in mind, it is a pure alpha and beta agonist. It's going to get everything. But definitely refractory asthma, epi is a good option. So primatine mist inhaler that was available and disappeared, it's now back. It's available over the counter. And you may find people that have asthma that they're treating themselves with primatine mist. It is epinephrine. It went away because of its CFC, but it is now back. But definitely that patient is not getting better with one treatment. Think about going to something else. And epi is a really good option. We nebulize it or we give it to a IM. So racemic epi. So racemic epi is a half of that epinephrine. It's part of the isomer. For years, we thought racemic epi was a really good agent for croup, for strider, and it still is. There has been a couple studies that show that it's probably no better than epinephrine. The thought is initially that racemic, it's half of the isomers, so it's a little lighter in weight. So racemic may stay in the upper airways more than epinephrine, which is heavier and goes to the deeper airways. So if you have racemic available, it's great to use for strider or croup. If you don't have it available, you could easily nebulize epinephrine as well and get the same benefit. But epi may give you a little bit more of that beta effect. It may give you some more of that other systemic effects that you don't always see with racemic. The big thing here is if we're giving somebody racemic, we need to watch them for several hours because let's see what happens when the medication wears off. If that kid gets a racemic, they do great, but in two to three hours, the croup comes back, that kid can't go home. That kid's going to have to come in. You used to think it was this rebound effect. It's not really rebound. It's just the drug wears off. It's half-life ex exhaust, and the drug wears off. So let's watch them. Asmonephrine that's available over the counter is racemic epinephrine. So if you hear somebody taking it, they're using it to treat themselves probably for their asthma as well. It helps some, but not as good as, say, the epinephrine or the albuterol itself. Albuterol has been our beta-2 agonist of choice for years. Albuterol is a really good beta agonist. It's going to help several things there in the bronchial tree. As I mentioned, it is beta-2 selective, but it still has some beta-1 properties. Leave albuterol is simply a different version of albuterol, thought to have less beta-1 effects. It is more expensive, and in some patients that are truly sensitive to beta-2 agonists, leave albuterol might be a good option. Most of the time, we would go ahead and do that nebulization there in the ED. With the COVID-19 pandemic initially, we kind of stopped doing those. For most people, the middle dose inhalers are just as effective, and they probably don't waste as much of the drug. So a lot of us have gone just to using MDIs in the ED versus the nebulizers. But definitely, if people aren't getting better with other things, we can try those. The MDIs are great, but people have to be able to do the right thing in the right order. They have to squeeze and inhale at the right time. And some people don't have really good psychomotor skills. And it takes some education there to get that to work. And I mentioned the leave albuterol, a little bit more expensive, but definitely is an option if someone is really sensitive. But both are equally effective at treating bronchial spasms, reducing airway inflammation and airway narrowing. Those are all SABAs, short-acting beta agonist. They're going to give us benefit for a couple of hours. For the most part, we talk about those being rescue drugs. And we look at the asthma guidelines, people should always have access to one of these, but it's not their mainstay of therapy for chronic management. That would be our LABAs, our long-acting beta agonist. 
Most of these are going to have a duration of about 12 to 24 hours. These long-acting beta agonists are really important for maintenance therapy. In asthma patients, it should always be combined with an inhaled corticosteroid. They have a black box warning for that warning that we know that LABAs by themselves actually may increase mortality. But if we combine it with an ICS, that doesn't happen. And anybody who has more than just intermittent asthma should always be on a LABA. And there's discussion in some of the literature about we should probably go ahead and initiate this or at least initiate inter, um, inhaled corticosteroid therapy in the ED. Because primary care is not always easy to get into. Or, hey, they'll see them in three weeks. That's not always the best option either. But it's really important for people to understand that LABAs are maintenance, and they can use it during their acute exacerbation, but it may not work for a couple of hours. They need to have access to a SABA. That's usually their albuterol or their leave albuterol. All these drugs can cause some systemic effects, especially in large doses. If they've had six of their albuterol treatments, they're probably going to have some systemic effects. They're going to be anxious. They're going to ha probably have some tachycardia, probably some palpitations. They're not going to be really happy. That's just the beta effects. But definitely educate people. Some people, especially if they have significant coronary artery disease, might be a little sensitive to that tachycardia, and if they have some demand things that may happen. But for the most part, these are well tolerated. Just have to educate people about them. Hey, this is what the beta agonist may do to you. So can I give you a just table of here showing these? And there's several others out there. Combination therapy we know is really helpful because if they do one inhaler versus two, you tend to have better compliance. But for, especially for asthma, LABA should always be used with an inhaled corticosteroid. Our methylxanthines, theophylline, haven't seen that used in a long time. It's not commonly used anymore like we used to mostly used with COPD anyway, but if someone still is on theophylline, they've got really significant pulmonary disease. It has some toxic effects just from chronic use. So if they're on theophylline, they've got really bad lung disease. So magnesium. So magnesium is a smooth muscle relaxer. It works for several things. We use it for preterm labor for that reason. We also use it for other things. But magnesium is going to work in a different pathway to relax the bronchi. So typically in adults, we're going to give two grams IV piggyback over 10 minutes. That's all they need, and that usually makes a difference. Children should be weight-based 50 per kilo. But in that person who's refractory asthma, we've given albuterol, we've given ipotropin, we may have even given epinephrine. Let's think about some magnesium. Magnesium is going to work on a different pathway, but also give us some smooth muscle relaxation, and that may be enough to break this refractory cycle. Don't give it too fast because it vasodilates things, drops some blood pressure, makes them feel real flushed. And luckily, two grams is not a lot compared to when we get to OB, we talk about six grams, and they really hate us then. But over 10 or 15 minutes usually does fine with that. But if they've not gotten a lot better with other things, think about magnesium. And we should do it sooner versus later. If they've already had a couple treatments at home, go ahead and get the mag going. It really can help. Yes? So the question was, do we need to watch them for several hours? Not necessarily for the magnesium itself. Obviously, we should watch them for several hours post all their treatments, but not specifically for the magnesium. Yes? Usually it's magnesium sulfate. That's what usually comes in the parental formulation. And some of us may have it pre-mixed or pharmacy does it for us, but usually it's mag sulfate. So our corticosteroids. For years, we talked about things like systemic corticosteroids for inflammatory conditions. Plays a big role with asthma, also with COPD, but one of the important things here is also thinking about inhaled corticosteroids. So if I can give the corticosteroids right where they need to be, we tend to have more, more effect and less side effects. So we're going to reduce the inflammatory response, we're going to stop some of that histamine release, we're going to calm down some of that inflammation and that mucus production. Anybody who has more than, than intermediate asthma should be on an inhaled corticosteroid. And probably for most of us, we should start giving inhaled corticosteroids in the ED during an acute asthma attack. There's really no benefit of giving IV over oral or inhaled for the most part. So if you're giving that albuterol treatment, that epi treatment, go ahead and give them an inhaled corticosteroid as well. Put it where it needs to work, right here in the lung tissue. So we've got several options here. If it's a short course of, say, five to seven days, they don't need a taper. Corticosteroid tapers are only important if it's been over two weeks of therapy. And hopefully we're not having to do that. They need close follow-up care anyway. 
But think about the role. We can give them some steroids. Give them some prednisone to take by mouth. That's fine. IV steroids, sure, if we can't get them to take stuff by mouth, but it's no necessary. But think about the role of inhaled corticosteroids. Give them some bedesonide or whatever you have available. That tends to help. If all else fails, you can nebulize dexamethasone. You can actually drink it, too. It doesn't taste very good. Kids never like the taste of any of them. But you can always nebulize dex if you need to, and that will help reduce some of that inflammation as well. Inhaled corticosteroid use long-term for the most part is safe. There are a couple studies that show that in kids it may slow their stature, but by the time they reach adulthood, they will reach their normal expected stature. So it does cause a little bit of growth stunning, but they do regain that. For the most part, inhaled corticosteroids don't affect the HPA axis, but they could, unlike oral or systemic steroids, definitely are going to cause some HPA axis uh, inhibition. But any patient who has more than intermediate asthma should always be on an ICS. And that patient who we see in the ED who doesn't have proper therapy, if you can prescribe them an inhaled corticosteroid, please do. That is really going to help control and hopefully limit or prevent their exacerbations and try to get them in to see somebody if you don't have that available. So I kind of gave this table here, different potencies for the different corticosteroids that are out there. Hydrocortisone, which we don't use a lot for asthma, is our baseline prototype when we compare everything back to hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone is the most like cortisol, but some of these are really potent, some of these are not as potent, but we have different levels, low, medium, and even high intensity uh, inhaled corticosteroids. In that case, hopefully we've got some of this managing them like a pulmonologist or an asthma specialist to manage those patients. But definitely if they're not on one and they can get one, please prescribe them in a health corticosteroid from the ED. We may even start the therapy there. Oftentimes if I can, I, they can't afford it, I'm just going to give it to them in the ED and they can take it home with them. We'll deal with the cost later. I don't care. But if they have low resources, if I can at least give them an inhaler in the ER, now they have it to use. So they get follow-up care. Same with our COPD patients. Almost all these patients would benefit from being on an inhaled corticosteroid. Again, we're trying to reduce that inflammatory response. And there are several options out there. You can get ICS combined with a LABA or by itself. There are some newer, longer-acting drugs that are out there that we can use as well. Antimuscarinics also play a big role with COPD management. Smoking cessation is also really important. It does not reverse the damage that's done, but it does reverse and remove that trigger. Because if they're not smoking, they don't have the exposure to that allergen that triggers the immune response as much. And patients will argue all day long, I've been smoking for 30 years, why quit? Well, if you might make your next 10 years a little better off. But medication therapy is really important for all these patients. But unfortunately, as you can see, some of them are not very cheap, $400, $300. Good RX may come into play. Hopefully, you have some kind of resource program for patients that they don't have financial resources to afford these medications. They're really important for improving their quality of life and suppressing their disease process. In health corticosteroids, the big thing I usually worry about there is it can cause an oral uh, candidal infection because it does suppress those areas. So typically, we do recommend that patients that are using a health corticosteroid just rinse their mouth out afterwards and spit it out. That does reduce the risk of them getting either oral or esophageal candidal infections. Because most of that inhaled corticosteroid, they swallow it. We want to get as much of the lungs as possible. They end up swallowing a lot of it. And I've already covered most of these things. Suppression does happen, but not as common. Most of these patients do very well and tolerate these very well and are really important for persistent asthma or for chronic COPD. Our monoclonal antibodies. Occasionally, run into patients that are on these. So these are some of our newer MAB drugs. Anytime you see MAB, that's a monoclonal antibody. And these are to go in and try to suppress the immune response as well. We're not giving these in the ED, but I've definitely encountered people that have had significant reactions to some of these when they're getting their infusions. So either go in and get an infusion or injection, and that is to suppress the immune response. And usually works really well. But if you're encountering a patient who is on one of these agents, they have significant refractory asthma. And these drugs work. They're going to either work on inosilophilic suppression or another part of the immune response. But that just tells you this person has significant persistent asthma, and they've had to go up to the step five or step six approach for their asthma. But if they, you encounter them, they're having that allergic reaction, to just like any other anaphylaxis. We'll talk about this more in a little bit, but it's epinephrine. Epi is our drug of choice for anaphylaxis. 
These are not cheap, as you can see, uh, for one of them, $38,000 a year. But if someone has a lot of asthma exacerbation, these can be good options. And you may see people that are on these and just recognize they have severe asthma if they're on one of these agents. So this is a table that kind of goes through the stepwise approach. And some of the new guidelines that just came out, the GINA guidelines, they've kind of revised some of this, so you may see, start seeing that come in the literature. But intermittent asthma. So they have only a few symptoms, only a few attacks. Those patients probably would benefit from at least having just a SABA access. Some people may go ahead and put them on an inhaled corticosteroid. But anybody that has persistent asthma should always be on an ICS, and we need to think about needing access to a SABA and also a LABA as well. And as they move up the severity based on the number of symptoms, the number of exacerbations, the more aggressive their therapy is going to be. But these patients should always have access to a SABA and ideally an ICS as well. So here's the stepwise approach, just kind of give you an idea. Most of us aren't managing this chronically in our practice, but definitely if you're seeing somebody who's on a high-dose ICS with a LABA and an oral steroid, that's step six. They've got significant disease. If they're on one of those MAB therapies, that's significant disease. But it's kind of give you the guidelines that are out there to what we're using and what the current recommendations are. So if you encounter that patient, you kind of have an idea of where they're at. Because sometimes they're great historians, and sometimes they're not. So what can they tell us? What can the drugs tell us about their disease process? And then our guidelines for treating COPD, most of this is going to be based on pulmonary function tests, so usually followed by either primary or pulmonology, but just kind of get an idea of where they're at. You know, they may be on that ICS with a SABA. Anticholinergics or the antimuscarinics are usually their first line, but you may start seeing them get up to where they're actually having a LABA use or other drugs. And of course, when they get up to needing O2, they've got significant disease. And really there is just trying to improve their quality of life. We recommend pulmonary rehab, trying to improve their quality of life through either doing personal breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, and all these therapies that are out there. But just kind of have an idea what drugs are on, kind of guide you to how severe their disease is. And then our antihistamines. So we have our first and our second generation antihistamines play a significant role with things like allergic rhinitis, seasonal allergies. Several of these are now over the counter. There's only a few left that aren't from either group. Our first-generation drugs are going to get all the receptors and tend to cross the blood-brain barrier. So your first-generation drugs tend to cause some drowsiness. That's why diphenhydramine is the king ingredient in most over-the-counter sleep aids. All these antihistamines are also anticholinergics. So especially first-generation may cause that dry mouth, urinary retention, constipation that we sometimes run into, especially they take them a lot. They're taking diphenhydramine every night to sleep. They probably wake up that dry mouth a little bit of urinary tension, constipation over time. Our second generation drugs, those are a little bit more selective. Those tend not to cross the blood brain barrier. So they kind of give us a little bit better localized treatment without a lot of systemic disease. And I added in there because uh, cetrazine is now available in an IV formulation that just came out a few months ago. And I don't think that made it to your print. But we now can give either diphenhydramine IV or cetrazine IV as well. So if someone truly is allergic to diphenhydramine, that is an option now for treating them. I've encountered a couple of people, actually this one two weeks ago, that swore she was allergic to diphenhydramine. I gave her some hydroxyzine and she did fine. But she was having an allergic reaction. But you do have a couple options now for this. But just keep in mind, first generation, work, but they're going to give you some drowsiness, some sleepiness. Second generation, not as bad. But these should be your first sign things for seasonal allergies, allergic rhinitis, going to help with those symptomology, dry those up, but also play a role with some other things as well. These should not be used in treating asthma because they do have a histamine component, but these don't have a benefit. Tolerance can happen if they use it chronically. So that person who was taking 25 Benadryl for sleep now has to take 50 or 75. The longer you use it, like most everything else, your body does develop some tolerance to it. For the most part, these drugs are very well tolerated, first generation, more concerning, and they're on the beers list, and we'll come back to the beers list in a few moments, or later this morning, and talk about it. 